I love her. I love you. I've watched all your videos. <laughs> You're my girl. Okay, welcome. My name is Peggy Sattler, MPP for London West, and I want to welcome you to this media conference this afternoon. I want to recognize my colleague Monique Taylor, uh, who is uh, MPP for Hamilton Mountain, who has also joined us. I am uh, grateful to be here today with uh, with my with London West constituent Jessica Ashton, who will be sharing her fight to get services for her son. I'm also joined by uh, Bruce McIntosh of the Ontario Autism Coalition, who will speak about similar struggles faced by families across the province who are fighting for services at home and at school. Jessica and her husband Scott are one of the many Ontario families who have been calling for government action to ensure that children with autism have access to the services they need. By the time their son starts getting the therapy he requires, it will be three years or more since they first realized that Ashton was different until he was referred to a specialist, to diagnosis, to service. And Ashton is a child with severe needs. This is completely unacceptable, and it is no wonder that almost 6,500 Londoners in only two months have signed on to support Jessica's petition campaign to reduce wait times for children with autism. Despite this government's new Ontario Autism Program, children with autism and their families continue to struggle to get the services and therapy they require. Children wait for adequate services. They must wait to be diagnosed by a developmental pediatrician to get a diagnosis. After they are diagnosed, they must wait for access to services. But as Jessica and Scott and every other parent of a child with autism will tell you, each day a child with autism waits for service is a day they will never get back. Families of children with autism already have extremely stressful, exhausting lives. They should not have to fight every step of the way to get the services their children need to thrive. New Democrats have been proud to stand with families of children with autism for years. And I, I want to again acknowledge the efforts of my uh, colleague, uh, MPP Monique Taylor, who has been advocating on behalf of families and leading the fight. As we transition to the new Ontario Autism Program, families are confused about what the future holds. They have been let down too many times before and the lack of clarity gives them little confidence that they will get answers soon. Not only are there mixed messages, but there are also rumours that the government is considering more studies which will further slow the implementation of the OAP. It's been nearly six months since the new program was announced and families are wondering what changes are coming their way. Families deserve transparency and they deserve to know what to expect. I'd now like to turn it over to Jessica to share her story. I would like to thank you all for being here. Like Peggy said, my name is Jessica Ashton and I am here to help raise awareness about the extreme wait times affecting children with autism in our province. I have a three and a half year old son named Ashton. At 18 months, my son stopped responding to his name and had no words but an obsessive love for the alphabet. That's when my husband and I realized that Ashton was different. Over a year after that realization, we finally made it to the top of the developmental pediatrician's wait list. We were both happy to have finally made it to the top of the list, but scared for the outcome. On June 15, 2017, we were told that my son, Ashton, had severe autism. We were both devastated but now knew we had the answers to move for forward and get him the help he needs. I was previously warned by my son's pediatrician about the lack of help and long wait lists for children with autism. So after the diagnosis, I immediately dropped off Ashton's report to Thames Valley Children's Centre, where we were then told that Ashton was number 989 on the wait list for therapy. At that moment, I realized my son would likely not receive treatments for years to come. I thought to myself, this cannot be happening because all the research that I had done to that point urged that early intervention and therapy is imperative and essential for their future progress. This being because in the first three years of life, children are making over 700 new neural connections every second. These connections start to decrease at the age of three. So number 989 was unacceptable to me as I didn't want to lose this crucial window of opportunity. 
So I called every available resource and utilized every connection possible. And yet call after call after call after call would all end the same as just another number on an outrageously long wait list. So my husband and I decided to take action. We enrolled in a communication course to try to work with Ashton ourselves. And I got a petition going in hopes to both bring awareness and lobby the government to, make, to take action and help our children. After retaining over 6,000 signatures from people within my community, I got the opportunity to meet many new friends, most of them completely disgusted by the lack of help for these children. But I also had very, I had beautiful moments of parents sharing autism stories with me. And now, I, I know I'm not alone in this fight because, excuse me, because being an autism parent isn't easy. My days start at 6 a.m. after about four hours of sleep due to my son's in inability to sleep through the night. My mornings usually start with a meltdown because I may make the wrong meal for breakfast or I'm unable to explain to him what our day will consist of. We often have meltdowns wherever we go. Is it because we passed a place? <laughs> that he wanted to go and I was unable to explain to him that we will go another day or perhaps later? Or is it because his stomach hurts or does he have a toothache? These are the questions that I don't have the answers to and I am his mother. Can you imagine how that feels? My son has started to hit himself out of frustration for not being able to communicate excuse me, sorry guys, communicate his needs and thoughts. This is the struggle of one and 68 other mothers and fathers in this province that are dealing with a similar or even worse situation than me. Autism has become more prevalent. So if it isn't knocking on your door, the odds are one day it will. Sorry, I just I need a Kleenex. Thank you. Sorry about that. This is very emotional for me, obviously. Autism has become more prevalent, so if it isn't knocking on your door, the odds are one day it will be. Maybe not your child, maybe not your grandchild, maybe a niece, maybe a nephew, maybe a cousin. I just want everyone that is sitting here right now to really think about this. Go home tonight and think about what it would feel like to not be able to communicate or connect with people. Like, really think about that and let that sink in. Because that is the life and future for both children and adults living with autism. So why do we as Ontarians not try to change that future into a small possibility? We have the capability to do so. And yet, we don't. And that is just not acceptable. It's not acceptable to me, it's not acceptable to my child, and it certainly is not acceptable to the Ontarians and Canadians that I have met on this journey. One thing I love about this country and why I'm so proud to be Canadian is our compassion for people, people all over the world, and we are constantly setting a good example of that. The same compassion needs to be given to our children here at home, children that desperately need our help. So I am asking every one of you to really think about this upcoming election, and please take this issue into account when voting on your representative whether or not your child or someone close to you is affected. And do not just do it because you are compassionate. Also do it because one day, more than likely, my struggle may knock on a door close to you. I want to thank everyone for being here. I also, I want to thank you, Peggy. I want to thank you for caring about the cause and helping me spread the word about this failing system. Bruce, thank you for joining me and you are like my hero. You have been doing this advocacy work for years and you've been a real trailblazer, so thank you. And I look forward to working with the both of you guys in the future because I'm gonna keep fighting until these kids get help. We know you will. <laughs> thank you, Jessica. I'd now like to uh, ask Bruce to share his perspective on behalf of the Ontario Autism Coalition and as a parent. My name is Bruce McIntosh and I'm president of the Ontario Autism Coalition and I am a 
the parent of a nearly 18-year-old young man who has autism. The most troubling thing for me this morning at this event is hearing Jessica tell her family's story of a three-year-old boy and hearing almost the identical story that I would have told 15 years ago. It's not okay in Ontario. There has never been a time that there has not been a wait list. In the history of government-funded behavior analytic services for autism in Ontario, the wait list has done nothing but grow. Shell games have been played to put lipstick on the pig, such as one wait list for assessment and another for service, or one wait list for direct service and another wait list for direct funding. But regardless of how it may have been broken down to make the numbers sound better, the wait list for services has been measured in years. At a time when early intervention is critical, children with autism wait for years. And that will not change soon unless this government makes two vitally important changes. Earlier this year, in support of the work that I do on the Ontario Autism Program Advisory Committee, the Autism Coalition surveyed ABA providers throughout Ontario about their ability to expand their practices. The answers weren't surprising, but they were disappointing. Approximately 20% of ABA pr practitioners responded, and they told us that they could expand the number of clients they serve by about 20% in the first six months, and about a third a year from now. And that's not going to eliminate wait lists very soon. The Ministry of Children and Youth Services must, with all possible speed, work with the Ministry of Advanced Education and Skills Development to train and certify as many behavior analysts as possible. And this must begin now, not a year from now, as MCYS has suggested as a time frame. Waiting, where children are concerned, is negligent. And secondly, as I said, when I spoke in this place last week, in fact, sitting in this very same chair, the Ministry of Education must accelerate their training program for education assistance. The 320 staff across Ontario who will take part in the Ministry's pilot project announced last week isn't even a molecule in the bucket compared to the need for ABA in the classroom. To his credit, Minister Koto has put the OAP on a hurry-up schedule, and he set deadlines for the progress on its component parts. But without aggressive action on building professional capacity to serve an increasing number of children and youth with an autism spectrum diagnosis, we're bailing the boat with a teaspoon, and it's the kids who are drowning. Thanks for doing what you've done, Jessica. I think we'll be a pretty good team. <laughs> Yep. Okay, uh, thank you both. I will be proud to, uh, to bring these petitions into the legislature this afternoon and uh, uh, yes, and uh, with the uh, support of people like Jessica and uh, Bruce uh, coming forward to share your stories, uh, I am hopeful that we will finally see uh, some action to, uh, to meaningfully reduce uh, wait lists for children with autism like Ashton in this province. So thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Peggy. Thanks, Peggy.